Friends, what a joy to know you've chosen to join us in this half hour. And as we go through a text of scripture, I wanna focus on a theme that is a regular part of my teaching and my leadership, whether that's preaching on Sundays or it's in workshops through our membership class, one-on-one -on -one in large groups. There is this theme that I see that's so important and it's to get back to what life was like to be a follower of Jesus as God intended. Long before church got reduced to simply just an hour on Sunday or a place that you would go to, there was this way of life that Jesus invited us into. And as we go to Acts chapter two, verses 42 through 47, we're gonna see the activity of the early church. And if I could say it this way, I wanna focus on what does it mean for us to see the location of a church at work? And to see the location isn't, a building, it's not a particular location, but it's simply a way of life that it can be lived before a number of things. Five things, in fact, that we will discover today. And again, much of my teaching, much of my leadership uh, will draw threads into this sermon. If you want to follow up, of course, after the fact on our YouTube channel, simply search for Bel Air Church. You'll see a lot of themes all coming together in some previous sermon series. And as we go to the book of Acts chapter two, again, this is uh, the the story, the origin story, as it were, of the early church after the life of Jesus, after his death, his burial, his resurrection, after he ascended to the right hand of the Father, poured out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to all believers, whether Jew or Gentile, and after Peter preaches the first sermon of the early church and thousands come to faith and are baptized, it talks about this way of life. Again, more than an hour on Sunday, more than a building, it was a way of life centered around the reality of who Jesus is. Let me read for us, Acts chapter two, verses 42 through 47. They, these are the early Christians, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done in the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This, is my friends, the reading of God's word. And as we say every week, thanks be to God. Okay, so you've heard me say before, church, it's not an hour on Sunday, it's not a building. We are the church in relationship with Jesus. Church is simply a community of people defined by the reality of who Jesus is. Every metaphor of the church in the New Testament describes a community of people in relationship with Jesus. Now, I wanna press in even deeper into that because often people ask me, well, what does it mean to be the church? What am I called to do? And is it something that only happens on Sundays? Can I be the church in my places of work? Can I be the church at home in my neighborhoods? The answer is yes. And as we dive into this text, there's five things that I believe is the location of a church at work. A life lived before, number one, the word. Number two, a life lived before others. Number three, a life lived before the table. Number four, a life lived before the Lord. And finally, a life lived before the public. So first, a life lived before the word. You know, I wanna start with this rather than starting with a life lived before the Lord because we have to understand what we mean by and what God means by and what the early church meant by a life of following the Lord. In fact, the word can also be known not just as the written word of God, as it says here in Acts 42, it says they devoted themselves first and foremost to the apostles' teaching. But this teaching, these words pointed to the living word. Now, when I say a life lived before the word, what I'm talking about is a life lived before the word of God, Jesus the Christ. The Gospel of John chapter one says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. And we have beheld this one, this one who has come from God, the word of God, and his name is Jesus. He's full of both grace and truth. You see, all of the apostles teaching went away from all about do's and don'ts went away from all about laws that you're supposed to observe and what you're supposed to not do. 
All the teaching, all the words that they spoke pointed to Jesus. In fact, the Apostle Paul says very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says as an apostle that there is something of first importance. Uh, it's to say that there's many things that are important, but the thing of first importance, he says this in verse 3 of chapter 15, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. This is the most important thing. Listen to this, that Christ, the word of God, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have died. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So first and foremost, the community of faith, the early church, the location of the church at work, a life lived following Jesus was lived before the word. They saw every opportunity they could get to stand under the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus says, I've come not to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. In fact, as it says at the end of the gospel, according to Luke, Jesus encounters two disciples on the road to Emmaus and he opens up their eyes to all the things that were said about him in the law and the prophets. Now that phrase, the law and the prophets is shorthand for the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures, the entirety of the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to Malachi, the entirety of the Old Testament, it all points to Jesus. And so we as a church, Bel Air Church, 67 years, we are all about living our life before the word of God in relationship. And we see that every opportunity we get, whether that's in these moments, when we come with hearts open, with minds open, with lives open to asking the Holy Spirit to, to grow us, to sharpen us, to teach us, to, to transform us. Ultimately, we do so knowing that all of these words there's one behind them. That these aren't just fortune cookie sayings, these aren't just platitudes, this isn't just a, a list of principles to live by, but ultimately these words, they're alive and active. And God longs to be in a relationship with you. Again, we talk about following Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. There's an opportunity for you to live your life before the word of God. And we wanna be part of that journey. So these moments, of course, are opportunities for you to hear the teaching of God's word. But my encouragement to you is that you wouldn't settle for just this, that you would, on one hand, go back and look at other teachings that we have on our YouTube channel, but that you wouldn't just settle for just teaching through Bel Air Church, but that you would seek out biblical teachers, faithful teachers, who as they teach point how all of God's word, the written word points to the living word that is Jesus Christ. How amazing would it be if you lived your life before the word? First and foremost, more powerfully than any other message you could receive in your life, more than the news, more than a social media feed, more than gossip, more than opinions. Imagine if God's word was louder than any other words in your life. In doing so, you will discover who you really are, who God says you are. As you've heard me say before, the word remember is used so frequently in scripture. It outnumbers the word believe five times to one. It outnumbers the word trust two to one. We are forgetful people. And as we live our lives, not before the word of God, but if it's closed, if it's put away, we live our life before any other thing, we begin to forget who God is. We begin to forget the life that God invites us into. We begin to forget who we are called to be. And in the same way that the early church lived their life before the word, as it says, they devoted themselves. It didn't say that they kind of sampled or that they tasted or wanted just a little, you know, little bite. No, they devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching were all about Jesus, who was the fulfillment of God's salvation, that in Jesus we could find hope and healing, a source of reconciliation, not only to God, but ourselves, each other, and all of creation. All of it points to Jesus. We want to be on that journey with you. And again, after this message, at the very end, we have some resources for you so that you can live your life more and more before the word. But second, it was a life lived before the other. As it says here, they weren't just devoted to the apostles' teaching, they were devoted in 
fellowship. Now, fellowship is a is a word we don't use very often unless you're part of a church. Uh, it might have some baggage to it. But let me, let me simply say this, that when they lived their lives before the other, they saw an opportunity to live their life in the way that God called them to. In fact, as it says in the New Testament, there are 50 different one another verses. One another verses are verses, commands that Jesus gives the early church that include the phrase one another. We're called to pray for one another. We're called to bear one another's burdens. We're called to respect one another, serve one another, confess our sins to one another, build one another up. In this community, they saw an opportunity not to live before the other in such a way that it was all about themselves. You see, we live in a very hyper-individualistic culture. It's very natural, it's very easy for us deep in our modern, Western culture to see, you know, community as what's in it for me? You know, how are these people going to help me? How's this experience going to help me? How's this job going to help me? How's this friend group going to help me? And we rarely in our modern Western world live before the other unless it has to do with how the other can build us up. But Jesus completely turns everything on its head and says that if you want to gain your life, you must lose it. If you want to get ahead, you have to follow me. In fact, Jesus says that if you give your life away, if you serve, if you look out for other people's interests, you're following in the way of Jesus. Jesus says, I haven't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus's life isn't meant to be imitated but Jesus actually wants to be made alive in us. Scripture says that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. It's now Christ in us. We're actually making manifest, not some ideal or dream. It's not some new age thing, but it's actually Christ in us, the Apostle Paul says, which is the hope of glory. Only in that relationship, living a life before the word. Again, not seeing scripture as a list of do's and don'ts, a path to follow, you know, but it's a relationship with Jesus who is the word, who guides us, who leads us, who is our shepherd. Can we then move into community and live our life before others with joy, in community, with great unity in the midst of diversity? And this early church was was so profoundly different than any other community the ancient world had ever seen. People they couldn't believe it. The people who were welcomed into that community, the people who were embraced in that community, there was this uh, Roman emperor many decades later who was just so frustrated with the growth of the early church. And he wrote a letter to another one of his uh, leaders and basically said, they even care for our widows, our orphans, not just the Jewish widows and the Jewish orphans, that they're, they're caring for everybody's widows, everybody's orphans. People talk so highly of them. And even as it says here, it says that they were having goodwill of all the people. There was something about how they lived, how they loved, how they experienced community. It wasn't a monoculture. It wasn't, you know, telling people to change their behavior to conform to a singular ideal but that they were mutually serving one another, lifting one another. That's impossible without the Holy Spirit. Later on in Acts chapter four, it says uh, that they were of one heart, of one mind, of one accord. The Greek word is homothumadon. It literally means to have this sense. Uh, it's almost like a mob mentality of one heart, one mind, one accord, but, but a force for good, a force for love, a force for grace and of justice. This community is what the world needs right now. You know, I look around this country, I look around this city, there's so much division, there's so much hate, there's so much vitriol. And then once I go on social media, when I look on the news, it seems like there is this uh, desire, as someone told me recently who started a multinational social media brand, he says, you know, sadly, the thing that's most viral right now is hate more than love, more than peace, more than goodness. It's hate, it's discord, it's division. That These things are going viral and it, it accelerates our view of how divided we are. When in actual fact, we were made to be in community. And the only solution isn't to take some people out of power and put others in power, that's not gonna work. It's ultimately coming together as a community centered around the fullness of who Jesus is, 
allowing the Holy Spirit to move in us to see the other as Christ sees them, and ultimately to be the type of people that God longs for us to be. And wherever you live, no matter who you are, we want to be in community with you. We want to serve you. We want to care for you. We want to encourage you. We want to build you up. And we believe that you have things in your life, experiences, skill sets, God-given abilities. And if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, even spiritual gifts that can actually make Baylor Church better and the people in it. And so again, at the end of this time together, a resource at drewsames.com is for you to reach out and to find ways as we will help you to get into community wherever you live, whether that's starting a group, whether that's joining a group, we want to walk the journey of helping you live your life before others. And number three, they lived their life in the ancient world, in the first century before the table. It's one of the reasons why I'm at this table today. This is our communion table. And for the early church, there was something so significant about gathering together every single day and sharing meals with one another. As it says in Acts chapter 2, it says that they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. In the midst of those meals, there was also a very significant meal. In the midst of those suppers, there was also the Lord's Supper. First, the normal meals, and then we'll get to the, the communion meal. You know, to be at a table, to be invited in, to sit down and to break bread, to enjoy a meal is a sense of welcome. It's a sense of deep-seated intimacy. You know, to share a meal with somebody in the ancient world made you an equal. To be able to sit at the same table, at the same level, to enjoy the same food, to enjoy the same drink, there was no hierarchy in those days at a table. They all came with need. They needed to be fed. They all came with thirst. They needed to drink. And there was this sense of coming together in a communal way where they could relate to one another. And at that table, it was very different than many of our meals today that is just rushed, that is distracted with the screen while watching TV, while going on the go. There was this deep, deep sense of intimate community. There was a gladness, there was a joy, there was a richness. In fact, in the um, Spanish cultures, there's a word that's used, it's sobremesa. It literally means over the table. And it's a word that's used for a community of people after the meal is done where they don't get up from the table. And it can last for an hour or two. And it's very common in Spanish culture to sit at the table, to connect, to share stories, to laugh, to cry, to encourage, to question, to dialogue. There was something that happened at the table that was unlike anything else. And it wasn't just that kind of a meal that they experienced together as they did life together, as they opened up, as they were vulnerable, as they sharpened one another, as they encouraged one another, as they entered into dialogue. They also participated in the Lord's Supper. You know, when you live your life before the table, it's a sense of vulnerability, it's a sense of need, but it's also a sense of receiving. And how amazing in the early church that when they gathered together, that in the midst of these meals, they would partake in the bread and the cup. All the imagery of the Passover meal, where there was the bread of affliction, the afikomen, which signified their affliction in the wilderness, Jesus took upon himself all the imagery of that. And he said, this is my body. By the way, that had never been said before at a Passover meal. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do so in remembrance of me. And when they lived their life before the table, it was also a sense of receiving the finished work of Christ, the love of Christ. And they reminded one another of that. Imagine the stories that they shared where somebody, you know, didn't measure up even to their own ideals, where there was brokenness in a relationship. They could remind one another, you know, at this table, at the Lord's table, you are received, you are loved, you are welcome. Christ gave his all and he didn't just give his body broken, he shed his blood for you. And at that table, they partook in the cup. 
And again, that cup was one of four cups of a Passover meal. And Jesus had said what he never said before in any Passover meals before that this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Pour it out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink and do so in remembrance of me. And so the early church, when they participated, not just in regular meals, but in the, in the Lord's Supper, there was giving, there was receiving, there was a filling up, and it was a reminder of the life they were called to live as faithful followers of Jesus. And then it allowed them to live their life before the Lord. You know, as it says here in verse 47, they were praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And earlier it says that they devoted themselves to prayer. You see, when you live your life before the Lord, you do so in prayer and in worship. I like to think of prayer as simply a dialogue. It's listening and it's speaking, which is very different than the common perception of, of prayer is just having the right words to say. And somehow maybe if I... If I get the, the words in the right order, if I say the right prayer, then somehow I'm going to get the thing I need or somehow feel a sense of presence. But ultimately, prayer in the ancient world, in the early church, was a dialogue. Again, as we live our life before the Word, we get to allow God's Word to be written on our heart. And I found in my life that the more time I spend in God's Word, that when I get to a time of prayer and I say, God, I want to hear from you today in the midst of all the stuff I'm navigating, in the midst of the, the difficulties that I face, in the midst of just impossible situations, I want you to guide me. I need you. I need your voice. And I'm telling you, the more time that I've spent in God's Word, the more quickly I find that different verses come to mind. Verses like, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verses like, follow me. I will show you the way. Verses like, trust me. All these verses that I have allowed God to write on my heart when I go to God in prayer to listen first, I immediately begin to experience God's voice in my life. And that's why it's so important to live our life before the word as we live our life before the Lord. Because if we cut out the word, then we can mistake the shepherd's voice for anything our heart wants. And again, it's not just listening to the Lord, but it's also speaking. Honestly, I love, for example, Psalm 13, the rawness and the realness of King David, who's described as a man after God's own heart. He says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I sleep this, this sleep of death? How long will you let my enemies triumph over me? This was a, a section of scripture that I committed to heart and memory and I prayed after my younger brother died. And I saw beautiful words, vulnerable words, powerful words, shocking words in some ways that God allowed to be prayed to him. And it seems like to say that David, who has all of his mistakes, all of his hang all the things that he did wrong, to say that he's a man after God's own heart seems to indicate that, that we are called to pour our hearts out in real ways, and honest ways, that we can actually be angry and vulnerable and have doubt and be frustrated and be bitter. But if we bring that before the Lord, if we bring our emotions before the Lord, God's big enough to handle it. And my hope and my prayer is that we would be able to be a community that models for you, but also as we learn from you, what it looks like to live a life before the Lord in every area of our life, listening to God speaking to God. And it's not just in that prayer life, but it's also in worship. I love in Colossians 3, 23, I've been sharing with our staff here at Bel Air Church, this amazing phrase. It says, whatever you do, work unto the Lord with full joy because you work not for human masters or bosses, but you, you work for the Lord. And it's this reminder that whatever we do can be an act of worship, that the work you do in the world, it matters to God and how you do it matters to God. That if you are a banker, be the best banker, filled with integrity, honesty. That you can be a person that writes things and creates things and records things and puts things out into the world. That actually it can be an act of worship. And when you live your life like the other church did, before the Lord in prayer and worship, it begins to be something 
that spills out, not just when we're together as Christians, but spills out into every single area of our life. And as it says here, there was something that happened. You see, they lived their life, fifth and finally, before the public. It's a tricky time right now to be a Christian. I've been saying to my wife recently, you know, it's going to be really interesting the next five years, what it's going to look like to be a, not just a Christian, but to be a pastor in Los Angeles. In some ways, it's getting harder and harder. But at the same time, I believe there's no greater time to be a follower of Jesus. I believe the world needs us as followers of Christ right now to live our life before the world, before the public. And what's so beautiful, though it says day by day as they spend much time together in the temple, you know, on the surface, it might feel like, well, they lived their life inside the temple. We actually get clues later on that they weren't in the temple. They were outside the temple in a place called Solomon's Porch. Solomon's Porch was the most public place connected to the temple. You see, if you were a Gentile, you could only go a certain distance in. You couldn't go past the court of the Gentiles. If you're a woman, you couldn't go as far as the men. If you're a man, you couldn't go as far as the priests. If you were a priest, you couldn't go as far as the high priest. There seemed to be thresholds. When the early church met at Solomon's porch, this was on the east end, a covered, public, outside the temple area, they were amidst crowds and they were living their life and worship to God in powerful ways where signs and wonders were being done through them in such ways that it caused people to have goodwill to them. And as it says, and day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I believe in the season ahead, there's an opportunity for us to be the church at work. Not just the activity that we do when we're together, but literally the church at work, in public places, wherever our Monday through Friday is, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our vacations. What an opportunity for us to be the church at work. And the location of that is everywhere. My hope and my prayer is that your heart and your mind would be in the same place as your feet. And wherever that is, that you would live that before the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your love. I thank you that you meet us wherever we are. And right here in this moment, would you give us a vision for the life that you call us to? It's your name we pray and we say together, amen. Like I said, all throughout the sermon, if you go to drewsams.com, ways in which you can take the next step as we journey together to follow Jesus every day and everywhere with everyone. May God bless you.